Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, first off, to start off our webinar series today, I'd like to thank our 2022 Home on the Range webinar series sponsor, the Kamloops Large Animal Veterinary Clinic. They've been generous enough to provide us with some funding to help support this awesome webinar series. Um, so first off, I'm Amanda Miller. I'm the vice president of the BC chapter for the Society for Range Management. Um, and I'm hosting the webinar series today. Uh, so first off, a couple of things on how to use Zoom. So down at the bottom, you have the option to mute um, and to stop your video if you don't wanna have your video going. And then there's also a chat box, which is where I would ask people to put questions as they come along, and then we can move into a question period um, at the end of this session. <clears throat> so, and now I would like to welcome our first speaker of the for this for this webinar series so i'd like to welcome annabel dombro she is from edmonton and is attending the university of alberta um, she's in the second year of her master's degree and she's studying rangeland and wildlife resources her talk today is going to be on the containment or rest slash restoration of annual brome grass invaded northern prairies using the herbicide in dazaflam um, so, Annabelle, I'd like you to go ahead and uh, share your screen. Thanks, Amanda. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to, like, meet you, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm Annabelle. I'm from the University of Alberta. Um, a master's student at the University of Alberta, and I've been looking at annual brome grass control using indazaflam on Alberta rangeland, and here are some of my results from three years post-treatment that I hope will um, hope give a better understanding of this potential control tool. So in Alberta, our mixed grass prairies are only 27% uh, of what they used to be. And similarly in BC, um, areas like the grasslands, the shrub steppe, and the palouse prairie are also much less extensive than what they previously were. And this is uh, due to reasons like land use change, fragmentation of habitat, woody plant encroachment, over grazing, fire suppression, and also um, impacting that is our invasive species. So uh, annual brome grass is the invasive species that I'll be talking about today, and they challenge the maintenance of functional rangeland ecosystems. So um, the main annual brome grass that people probably know about is called cheek grass um, or downy brome, uh, but in Canada we have a number of brome grass species with annual life cycles that also act um, invasively and act very similarly to cheatgrass. So I just call them uh, all like a group called annual brome grasses. Um, like, for example, I know that in the Palos Prairie, that area has been really uh, heavily hit by annual species and some of the area has turned into annual dominated grasslands. And with that comes a loss of uh, functionality. So. In terms of livestock production, these species are um, not a very desirable forage, so they can result in less forage production, um, less reliable forage production, um, less animal gains. Um, I've seen at my sites, so here is an example of like a pretty invaded um, patch. I've seen the animals like avoiding these areas, and I've seen a lot of these um, clumps on the ground that looked like animals had taken a bite and then spat it back out. So um, just not very palatable for animals either, um, except for a short period in the early spring. Um, there, and then there are also impacts to like wildlife and biodiversity. So for all those reasons, it might be desirable to um, control these species or try to contain their spread. And I just want to mention the spatial significance of annual bromes as well, because it's like 
one of, if not the most um, spatially significant invasive plants in North America. It, um, in 2004, it was estimated that it uh, covered over 22 million hectares in the 17 Western United States. And that's definitely uh, increased, the number has increased at this point um, by 2022. Uh, these species are found in every state of the US and every province in Canada, except for Newfoundland and Labrador. And they're spreading north where they have historically been less abundant. So I know that they're, they have been and are uh, like continuing to become a, a larger issue in Southern BC. Um, and the same is happening in Southern Alberta. So here is a map from Alberta Environments and Parks. Um, they have recorded 530 occurrences of annual brooms in Alberta um, from their range health assessments since 2003. And you can see like a quite a high density near the border. So indazaflam is a new two rangeland herbicide. Um, it's made by Bayer and they call it Rejuvra. It's a cellulose biosynthesis inhibiting herbicide that prevents seedlings from establishing. So it um, impedes the root growth and shoot growth of germinating seedlings. It's not meant to target already growing plants. Um, so when you spray it, it's sort of like a soil applied herbicide, not a foliar uh, herbicide. Um, it gets sort of trapped in the litter and then it needs moisture to wash it down into the soil. It's supposed to stay in the top soil and then just control the seed bank. So that makes it a candidate for controlling annual species within perennial rangelands because uh, perennial plants don't rely on seeds as much for their life. Um, and dazaflam persists in the soil for quite a long time, potentially providing multiple years of control. So um, like for example, downy rome seeds can uh, like have been found to remain viable in the soil for th about three to five years. Um, and then there have been some studies, uh, field studies done in the US and Colorado by Derek Sebastian and Shannon Clark, and they've found that indazaflam could provide high levels of control regardless of timing of application. And in another study, they found 83 to 100% control three years after treatment. So quite high levels of control and like uh, long lasting control, which um, is interesting. And so we wanted to see uh, how this herbicide would work in more Northern prairies where we have a different climate, um, soils, plant community, um, which can all affect herbicide properties and like longevity. So we want to see the level of control um, how long the control lasts, what the appropriate dose is, and the best time uh, timing of application is. So um, for our field study, we have two sites in southern Alberta in the dry mixed grass uh, prairie, which receives 333 millimeters of pre precipitation per year. So it's a pretty dry area or a very dry area. Um, we have one site at a private ranch called Ross Ranch, and that's on Orthic Brown Chernism. Our other site is at the Provincial Pinhorn Provincial Grazing Reserve, and that's on Solonetic Brown Chernism. So that one's a bit more saline soil. And here is a picture of one of our um, sites. It has an exclosure, and then the plots are um, inside the exclosure. So at each of those two sites, we have a randomized complete block design with four reps. And then within each rep, we have um, eight treatments. So plots uh, were either sprayed in the fall or in the spring, and we only sprayed a uh, one-time one uh, one application and then monitored um, the plant community for three years, but we did not spray um, each year, just one time at the beginning. Um, 
So it was either sprayed in the fall on October 15th in 2019. So that was kind of aiming to target brome before it um, germinated. So annual bromes can, they can germinate throughout the year, um, but they typically follow a winter annual life cycle. So they germinate in the fall following um, a loss of like dormancy in the summer heat. They germinate in the fall and then over winter and then re uh, resume their growth in the spring. So I think this application was aiming to target them prior to emergence or shortly after their emergence. And then the spring application uh, would be late after their emergence, likely. And then uh, we also sprayed at four different rates of endazofarm. So we have zero, uh, which has our untreated controls. Um, in those plots, nothing was applied. So that's just like the original grassland. And then we sprayed at 0.5, 1, and 2 times the recommended rate of endazofarm, which is 75 grams of active ingredient per hectare. So 2 times that is 150, and half of that is 37.5. And then we uh, followed the level of control for three years by sampling the biomass of annual brome at peak growth in 2020, 2021, and 2022. And then I've done my analysis using log response ratios. So they um, standardized the data to look at how uh, plots with endazofarm are different from, from the untreated controls. It's just the natural log of the treatment biomass divided by the untreated control uh, plot biomass. So if that ratio is zero, it indicates no treatment effect. So, um, the biomass was the same in the treatment and the untreated control. If it's negative, the treatment had less biomass than the control. And if it's positive, the treatment had more biomass than the control. And then I also did some ANOVA, which is um, analysis of fairness. So here is the first log response ratio graph um, of annual brome biomass in 2020. That's the year after treatment. So at that point, it had been about eight months since the fall treatment and three months since the spring treatment. And so um, I'll explain these graphs. So on the y-axis, I have the site and the treatment. So um, on every graph, the pinhorn site is always at the top and then the ROS site is at the bottom. Then within each site, the fall treatments are at the top and the spring are at the bottom. And within each um, season are are then the rates going from lowest to the highest rate, which is 150. And then on the X, we have the log response ratio. So remember, if it's zero, that's uh, no treatment effect. So the dot is the mean, and then the whiskers are the 95% confidence interval. So that means that within those boundaries, we're 95% confident that the true mean biomass lies within those boundaries. And so in this analysis, if the 95% confidence intervals cross the zero line, which is indicated by the, the dashed line, um, then it's uh, considered that, that there is no treatment effect. So in this year following treatment, um, all of them crossed, crossed the zero line. So there, was, there were no treatment effects. So don't expect huge responses in the first year. And I think this might be due to um, the precipitation we got after treatment. So in diazofarm, it can get trapped in the litter and it needs um, it needs like immediate rainfall to wash it down into the soil. Um, so it can come in contact with the seeds. Um, and after our fall application, we didn't get any significant rainfall for like about two weeks. So at that point, the diazofarm could absorb uh, more strongly to the litter. And after our spring application, we did get a little bit of uh, rainfall the day after, but it wasn't a lot. Um, and also at that, at the time of the spring application, um, that was post brome emergence. And remember, lindazoflam is meant to target um, germinating seedlings, not already growing plants. 
Then here is the annual bone biomass in 2021. That's our second year after treatment. And in this year, we saw treatment effects. So at the pinhorn site, we had a rate effect and a season effect. Um, so all the fall treatments were effective. Um, the 150 gram weight uh, had the lowest log response ratio and that um, back transforms to an 84 to 99% reduction in biomass, in bone biomass. Um, out of the spring treatments, only the highest rate treatment was effective and that gave a 35 to 97% reduction. At the Ross site, we had a rate effect and all the treatments were, um, all the treatments controlled brome because they um, were all below this zero line. But again, the lowest log response ratio was in the fall 150 treatment and the highest was in the spring 37.5. So it seemed that in this year, the fall treatments were a little bit better than the spring treatments. Um, and I think that's that could be due to the fall um, application time in catching more uh, brome before it had germinated. Um, at this point, the fall treatment in Dazaflam had also had more time to wash off the litter and into the soil. Um, and then we, we saw that even the lower rates could provide some control, um, but they were a little bit less consistent than the higher uh, rates. And uh, finally, here is the brown biomass in 2022. That's our third year post-treatment. So this is from our, the past summer. Um, all treatments were effective at both sites. And the rate or season of treatment was not uh, significant in affecting control. Um, and with 95% confidence, every treatment controlled brown biomass between 90 to 100% except for the pin run fall 37.5. So that had a 73 to 90% reduction. Um, the fall 37.5 at Ross had a 42 to 99% reduction and the spring 37.5 had a 66 to 99% reduction. So at this point, uh, it seemed that the fall and spring uh, application terms had kind of caught up with each other. Um, since it is such a long lasting herbicide. And then uh, I, think, I think it's interesting that the low rates uh, can also provide decent levels of control um, because I mean, I guess for an economic and environmental reasons, it's good to avoid excess herbicide use. And in terms of that, like looking at the double rates of the 150 compared to the 75 rates, the 150 rates didn't really seem to offer a great benefit um, compared to the, the, the single rate. And I, uh, I, I want to, to mention that in 2022, our brown biomass in general, like across the site and across the controls was very low this year, I think due to low spring precipitation. So, um, uh, here is an example, of, uh, a picture from 2021. We have one of our fall 150 plots next to a control, untreated plot. And you can see in the control, there's a lot of uh, brome. And then in the fall 150 plot, the brome has been controlled and uh, you can see the perennials and it's looking pretty good. And um, across our whole site in this year, like was very, it was very patchy and you could definitely see like treatment effects across the site, but then in 2022, here's one of our fall 150 plots and it looks pretty good. And then here is um, a control plot and it also doesn't look uh, super bad. So in this year, the brome that, that did germinate was um, very small and short and kind of weak. And I think that just shows that um, brome production can be really variable from year to year, depending on precipitation. Um, and that can result in variable weed pressure from year to year. 
And it, it also shows the, maybe like the risks of relying on broom as a forage because of how much it can fluctuate from year to year. And here's um, just a bar graph showing the biomass in the untreated controls um, from year to year. So you can see that in 2020 it was very low, only like um, 20 kilograms per hectare, whereas in other years it was like 1,000 and, and 500. But that's why we use we use the controls um, to account for these differences. All right, and finally, uh, this is the native perennial grass biomass now, so not the brome anymore. So I want to see, you know, when the brome is being controlled, what's happening. Um, and we saw some increases in perennial grass biomass. So I averaged the perennial, native perennial grass biomass from 2021 and 2022 together because uh, those were the two years that we saw treatment effects. And so uh, what we saw at, at the Pinhorn site was that um, the 75, the fall 75 treatment and the fall 150 and the spring 150 treatment gave some uh, increases in biomass. And that's an increase from the 500 kilograms per hectare in the untreated plot. Um, and then at the Ross site, one treatment improved biomass, and that was the fall 150 treatment, and that was an 8 to 140% increase from, from 600 kilograms per hectare. So I think um, our study has indicated that indazoflam has long-term efficacy at controlling brome in the northern mixed prairie at both lower and higher rates. The higher rates of so the 75 and 150 gram rates were a bit more consistent than the 37.5 gram rate. Um, the timing of application was not critical. However, you can get um, faster control in upcoming years if you spray in the fall rather than waiting until the spring. And um, the double rate did not offer a huge benefit compared to the single rate. But the benefits of that double rate still kind of remain to be seen um, because in the longer term, uh, it could maybe offer some kind of benefit if it stays in the soil for longer. But even with the one times rate, um, there were quite high levels of control with that. And I would... Uh, like to say thank you to our collaborators at the range management branch um, at Alberta Environment and Parks and the Pinhorn Grazing Reserve, Ross Ranch, and um, thanks for funding from Alberta Environment and Parks and Buyer Crop Science. And thanks to everyone who has helped um, on this project. And uh, thanks to Amanda, like when she was working for Alberta Environment and Parks, she helped set up this uh, project and design the project and thanks Amanda for organizing this. Well, thank you, Annabelle. I appreciate it. And this is, it's wonderful to come full circle and see that, uh, that it's providing some great control. So I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, and I think I'm going to actually start off with my own first question, which is, so it seems that the fall treatment is the best option in these Canadian uh, northern mixed grass grasslands. Does it, does that align with what they found in the United States? Yeah, it does. I think I think the bromes in in both areas have um, a similar like growth pattern. Um, but really, what they've found in the United States is like it doesn't really matter what time you spray at because it will all kind of even out in the end or there were no you know there's no significant differences so it's more likely that the the issue was that the spring treatment didn't occur prior to germination that might be the problem here okay awesome um claudia hi thank you amanda and thank you um annabelle this was terrific 
Um, I'm curious at using twice the recommended rate, which of course comes from Bayer. Um, did you have to get any special permissions to apply at twice that recommended rate, or was that within a range on the label? I, I am assuming that you have similar guidelines in Canada as in the US for, for us, it's the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and we have this saying, the label is the law, and we ought to be careful not to exceed that. So how did that influence what you did experimentally? Um, I'm just curious to know about that kind of the policy connection, because one would be tempted if you really wanted to be effective to double the rate, but you know, obviously there could be consequences as you alluded to. So. Curious to hear about that. Thanks, Annabelle. Yeah, um, I'm not sure really in terms of like applying this on a larger scale. I know that for our experiment, um, I don't think there really were restrictions for our experiment. Um, and I, I'm not too sure about the policy behind it, but that's, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I would like be very hesitant for for people to start using a double rate. Yeah, but I'm not can... sure if Amanda knows anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just mention that it was done under a research permit for these pro uh, for these projects. So um, there was the ability to go off the the rate label just because it was done under a research permit, and it's partially to determine whether or not. Um, the rates that were determined in the states can are going to be effective in Canada, which it seems like it absolutely will be um, based off of the, the research findings. But to tie back into that, Claudia, um, Hannah Tomlinson has a great question. Uh, at higher rates, did you see any damage to the desirable perennial grasses? Um, yeah, so I'm really uh, interested in the non-target effects to the perennials um, and we have looked at that um, and I just didn't have time to present all that today but uh, so far I mean in terms of the biomass there were not effects to the perennials and in in other studies in the U.S. they have not found any uh, negative effects to species richness or diversity or um, perennial forbs or perennial grasses but um I will be like looking at that and analyzing my data on that we we took cover assessments and we're trying to see what happens to the plant community um I'm also doing a couple greenhouse studies so I have done a greenhouse study looking at uh impacts to the root growth of perennial native perennial grasses um because I there's not a lot of information about the cellulose biosynthesis inhibition mechanism. So it's not supposed to target uh, already growing plants, but if it's in contact with their roots, I assume that there would be some effect going on there. But um, no, we didn't really see like any um, injury or anything like that. Fantastic. Um, and what, Jen has a question, what were the native grass species you measured? Um, so the dominant species at our sites, uh, we measured whatever was there, but the dominant species are Agropyron smithii, or Pascopyron smithii. Um, we have needle and thread grass, Hesperocypa camada. We have Colaria macrantha, blue grama, and then we had a, quite a bit of Poa uh, Sandbergii or Poa secunda at our sites. Um, so those would be the main ones that we measured. Perfect. And Julie Conley asks, how long does the effect last of the herbicide and how frequently would you need to apply to maintain control? Yeah, so I think the objective of the herbicide is like that you only need to spray it once um, and then it it's it lasts long enough to deplete the brown seed bank so I think ideally you would just apply it once or maybe once and then five years later apply it again but um, I know that there was one study in the U.S. where they looked at 
applying once and then they applied like a second dose a year later, I think, and they didn't really find any differences in in the clots that were sprayed only once compared to the ones that had the double dose. Excellent. And I think we'll take one last question from Nicholas. Hi, I had a question about um, if you saw any um, broadleaf species that were resistant to the herbicide that were popping up in your test plots. And then I have another question. I'm curious, you know, if you're using this in a restoration type scenario, um, if there was any recommendations that you got from Bayer or things that you guys saw that would be um, applicable where you could apply this and deplete the brome and then possibly reseed over the top of it after a certain period of time and get some uh, reestablishment of native um, broad leaves. Um, okay, thanks. Um, for the broad leaves, like, I guess you mean broadleaf um, seeds that are germinating. And I, I, it's supposed to control any seeds that are germinating. So it's supposed to control the broad leaves as well. Um, and I have been looking at, um, I've done another field study looking at FORB germination in in the field and it definitely uh, controlled the uh, the forbs in the field i mean i haven't analyzed that data completely yet and then your second question was about uh restoration and reseeding so yeah i think that it is meant to be used in in those contexts and um Yeah, I think, I mean, you probably couldn't seed the year after you apply it, but uh, two or three years down the line, um, I've I've seen papers where they reseed and where they drill seed and and um, and it works for restoration. So I think at that point there there might not be as much uh, herbicide left in the soil. Awesome, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you, Annabelle, for your excellent presentation. Um, it sounds like this is a great tool that has a, a lot of potential for potential opportunities for not just uh, control of invasive annual brome grasses, but also future uh, research into how that control can coincide with things like reclamation, restoration, and forbs, and all those wonderful things on our rangelands. So with that, we'll draw this to a close. Um, please join us next week when Maddie Case is going to speak on drivers of annual grass invasion at local and regional scales. Annual grasses are a hot topic. So thank you everyone for joining us over this lunch hour and, um, and we will see you next week, hopefully. Bye.